Hey guys, welcome back to another Tech Show video. Today we're going back to 2008, the year of the iPhone 3G, the Blackberry Bold, and the T-Mobile G1. And yes, today we are going to be talking about the T-Mobile G1. This is a special video for me because I really like Android, and it's just so fascinating for me to be able to discover this legendary operating system's humble beginnings. And let's be honest, the Android operating system is the only thing that makes this phone something worth talking about. And CNET's Best Smartphones of 2008 article clearly states that fact. Almost everyone who first saw this phone commented about its ugly chin and chunky, cheap-feeling design. And why wouldn't they? By the time the G1 was out, Apple had already introduced the iPhone 3G four months earlier, and it was one of the most physically attractive smartphones at the time. Put it next to the G1 and they will look like they don't even belong to the same year. But what no one could argue was that the T-Mobile G1 was running an operating system with more power and potential than ever seen before on a smartphone. It was CNET that pretty much predicted the future when they said, quote, Thanks to the openness of the operating system, there's huge potential for the G1 and any Android devices after it to become powerful mini-computers as developers create more applications for Google Android. They couldn't have been more correct with these predictions, as there are now many Android-powered devices that are as powerful or more so than the computers of the time. It's easy to see why tech reviewers found this device to be so ugly, yet so intriguing. Next to the iPhone 3G, there's just no question which phone is more attractive, but the G1 had something else to offer, and it was called Android. Today, it's not as easy to see the hype around Android since it's something you are probably pretty familiar with, whether you love it or hate it, but back in 2008, the only operating system anyone knew of was Symbian OS, which, in comparison to Android, didn't even have an app store. On top of that, since Android was owned by Google, everyone automatically had high expectations for an OS built by one of the biggest tech companies out there. By default, Android included things like Google Search, Gmail, Google Maps, and YouTube. But I'm getting kind of off track because this video isn't about Android, and to be honest, unless you're a tech nerd, you probably would have never even heard anyone talking about Android in 2008. And one of the reasons for that is, the only phone running Android at the time was not that great of a phone. So let's take a look at it to see what was good and what was not so good about the T-Mobile G1. Now I've been calling this phone T-Mobile G1 throughout this whole video, but it's also known as the HTC Dream, and I honestly prefer that name, so I'm just going to refer to it as the Dream for the rest of this video. Up until now I've just been saying mostly negative things about this phone, and while yes, it is pretty chunky and kind of ugly, there are some good things about this phone. Obviously the fact that it ran Android would have been the best thing about this phone, but I've already talked enough about that. A big selling point for this phone was that it had expandable storage via a micro SD card. So you could just take the SD card from your old phone and pop it into the Dream, and you'd have all your music and photos and all of your other stuff right there, no need to worry about trying to transfer your files in other ways. Another thing it had was a physical keyboard, and before you start commenting that a physical keyboard isn't a good thing, please listen to a couple reasons why this was actually a good thing in this case. Then you can go ahead and post those comments if you still want to. In 2008, there were still two good reasons to have a physical keyboard on cell phones. For one thing, people were simply too used to typing on good old physical keyboards, and they thought software keyboards were just a futuristic gimmick, with some people even going so far as to say software keyboards would never take off. But the main reason physical keyboards were better than software keyboards was because they actually were. Even today, I prefer using the Dream's physical keyboard to the software keyboard on the iPhone 3G. It's really no surprise people weren't too convinced software keyboards were the next best thing. There's no haptic feedback, and they were incredibly slow. So yes, the keyboard on the HTC Dream is actually really nice, especially compared to 2008 software keyboards. Now let's talk about this ugly chin, because this is where probably the most unique feature of the Dream is. Right here in the center of the chin is a mini trackball, which I can only imagine the reason this is even a thing is because the Blackberry Pearl had one. And this could have really been a useful feature if it had been properly executed, and here it definitely wasn't. The way it works is extremely awkward and slow, and it only moves one character at a time, even with a full rotation. So this trackball is not fun to use, and I honestly think even a beginner smartphone user would find the touchscreen simple to use. The only thing this is actually sort of useful for is scrubbing through text. It's a little bit easier to do it like this than with the touchscreen, but otherwise it's a pretty useless feature. 
But what's not a useless feature is the 3.2 megapixel camera. Okay, so it's not much of a useful feature today, but according to CNET, they thought the Dreams camera was better than the iPhone 3G, which is kind of true and false. While I have seen worse, the Dreams camera isn't enough of an improvement to be practically better than any other device, which is ironic, since Android was originally designed to be an operating system for digital cameras. Every phone had a very blue tint, and as expected, it didn't perform very well in low lighting. The only place this camera impressed me was with its autofocus. It wasn't perfect every time, but it was pretty impressive with some macro shots, and by far better than the iPhone 3G. It's pretty impressive just to have autofocus on a phone this old at all, no matter how good or bad it is. There's also this dedicated camera shutter button that makes shooting in this phone feel a little more like a camera, which would have been a very nice feature at the time when people were still somewhat used to using point and shoot cameras. For some reason you can't use the camera shutter button to launch the camera app, which you can do on almost any other cell phone with a dedicated camera button. To summarize the camera on the Dream, it's not as good as the iPhone 3G's camera in my opinion, but there are some things that make it unique, pretty much like how this whole phone is a unique experience. And while uniqueness makes this phone fun to play with, I can see why Android had a pretty slow start. For a long time, this was the only phone to represent Android, and it didn't even have a headphone jack. That may not seem like a big thing today, but you have to remember back then, pretty much the only wireless headphones were for calls, and weren't that great of quality. But even if you did have wireless headphones, the Dream doesn't have stereo Bluetooth audio compatibility. So that means pretty much the only way to listen to music is through the built-in speaker, which isn't even a great speaker. So in summary of this phone, I think CNET put it best. They wrote in their article comparing the Dream to the iPhone 3G, The Dream doesn't quite offer the mass appeal and ease of use as the iPhone, so it won't be a good fit for someone making the jump from a regular mobile to their first smartphone. We'd say the HTC Dream is best suited for early adopters and gadget hounds who love tinkering around and modding their devices. And they were right. I think a lot of people like me were early adopters of Android devices because of the more powerful, customizable nature of Android. I mean, you couldn't even change the wallpaper on the first couple iPhones. You were just stuck with this gloomy void of a wallpaper on the main screen. On Android though, your imagination was the limit as to what you want your home screen to look like. Snap a photo or download one from online and set it as your wallpaper. Move the apps wherever you want, and widgets. Even the very first version of Android included widgets, which are pretty much a must-have for me. The HTC Dream, T-Mobile G1, whatever you want to call it, this has been a really great phone to check out. Definitely one of my favorite phones in my collection. If there are any other particular phones you want me to review, just leave that down in the comments. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to leave those below. And if you enjoyed this video, it would be awesome if you could drop a like and subscribe. Thanks again for watching, I'll see you in the next video.